Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker are at it again, and I guess some people might think that's a good thing. I'm Richard Roper. Filling in for Roger this week is a senior writer at Entertainment Weekly. He's a regular guest on the Today Show, Dave Carger. Welcome back, Dave. Thank you. I'm glad that we're putting Transformers behind us and moving on. <laughs> we have. And you know what? There's a reason God gave us these thumbs, so let's put them to good use. Right. Our first movie is Rush Hour 3. And for reasons beyond my understanding, the first two Rush Hour films made a lot of money, even though they were loud and obnoxious and devoid of imagination. Guess what? The third installment is so cartoonishly stupid, it makes the original look like a classic. Come on, man, let me go. I love Chinese people. Ah! Ah! Wait, I don't... Ah! That, of course, is Jackie Chan, who's now lost more than a step when it comes to stunts, and Chris Tucker, who manages to make his character even more of a screeching stereotype this time around. Who are you? You. No, not me, you. Yes, I am you. Are you there? No, you is blind. You. Yes? Not you, him. What's your name? Me. Yes, you. I am me. He's me. And I'm you. And I'm about to whoop your whole. Let's face it, Rush Hour 3 doesn't even pretend to have a cohesive story. It's all about sexist humor and cheap gags and the same old action sequences we've seen in hundreds of better films. It's okay. Tucker and Chan are supposed to be best friends, but they have basically no chemistry. They walk away from a series of fatalities, literally dancing and high-fiving. The Three Stooges were more grounded in reality. Dave, that's thumbs down. Yeah, it's a thumbs down for me, too. And unlike you, I actually enjoyed Rush Hour 2. I thought it had a manic energy. I thought there was that great sequence when Chris Tucker was singing Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael mm, Jackson, the mm, karaoke bar. Mm, but there was mm. none of that fun uh, in this. And in fact, they tried to ape that singing moment that was so funny in Rush Hour 2 in this one where Jackie Chan comes in, sings too. It was just really painful. You know what? It was funny in Beverly Hills Cop 20 years ago as well, Dave. I mean, you know, Brett Ratner knows how to do an action sequence. He certainly knows how to please an audience with these movies, but it's just so dopey. And, you know, the Chris Tucker character in particular is just such a lout and a jerk and he's a kind of a pervert, and he doesn't even exist in any kind of realistic comedic universe. He's just out there screeching away, and it's just, it's just I thought it was almost unwatchable. It's not like Chris Tucker's so busy doing other things. He's like the locust of movie stars. Yeah, he comes back once every seven years, and you think you should well, try a little bit harder. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest maybe a, a real locust-like hiatus <laughs> of 17 years might work, right, but actually. It's interesting, because once again, they've shown the blooper reel over the end credits, yeah, and there's yeah. actually some amusing things there. But to watch Brett Ratner, the director, feed Jackie Chan all these lines right. makes you realize that Jackie Chan basically doesn't know what he's saying. You're, you're so right about that, Dave. This is the first time a blooper reel actually gives you some insight into why a film doesn't work because you see that Jackie Chan literally does not understand the lines he's delivering, which makes it really tough to put any kind of comedic spin on them when you have no idea what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, and there's one moment that drove me crazy where they get an elevator in the lobby and they push three, mm -hmm. only two stories up, but it takes them 45 seconds to get up there and the That's scene That's the one moment forever. that drove me crazy? <laughs> all the crap that happened in this movie? A lot of it uh, drove me crazy, but let's move on to bigger and better things, shall uh, we? Well, bigger, maybe. Yeah, yeah, next up is another sequel, Daddy Day Camp, <laughs> the follow-up to the Eddie Murphy family film, Daddy Day Care, from a few years back. But Murphy seems to have chosen to make Norbit so over this one, <laughs> so Cuba Gooding Jr., who apparently isn't too picky Daddy nowadays, steps into the lead role instead. When Gooding finds out that his beloved childhood summer camp is in complete disrepair, he and his buddy decide to buy it with hopes of returning it to its former glory. Okay, this is it. Time to give them a summer they'll never forget. They won't forget that. Nope, that's not Jeff Garland as the best friend. He had the good sense to stay away from this stink bomb as well. Daddy Day Camp is directed by former Wonder Years star Fred Savage, who seems to think the kids will only laugh at a joke if it contains burps, farts, poo, or puke. What? Wow. What else could go wrong? No, 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 please. The humor in Daddy Day Camp is predictable, the kid actors are awful, and it's especially sad to see Gooding, an Oscar winner for God's sake, mugging and overacting like this. I know families are starved for options at the movie theater nowadays, but I hope they'll go see something inspired like Hairspray instead of this lazy mess. 
thumbs down. You're so right about this, Dave. Now, you see this, this graphic over my shoulder here? Yeah. That's the actors watching a screening of this film, <laughs> I think, saying, my career, my career. I mean, everything you said is so true. I mean, yeah, the kid actors are terrible. Cuba Gooding Jr. Everybody here is, they keep elevating the volume, thinking maybe if I scream these lines, it'll be funny. And the kids, you know, from the very start, running around in these various camps, they're not just cute, mischievous kids. They all have, like, serious psychological behavioral disorders, and they should all be, you know, under the serious care of medical professionals. I know. And listen, I... It's almost not fair to even try to criticize this movie because of the plot, but the plot is a total ripoff of Meatballs, where it's the rich kids camp against the poor kids camp. Uh -huh. But there's not even any scenes in this movie. Yeah, it's all these 15 horrible. or 20 second little comedy bits, and just, they all fall flat. Just horrible. And then, yeah, on top of everything else, you just have the Darren Stevens thing, where you just have all these actors <laughs> taking over the roles. Like, Why didn't they just make him his cousin or something? So that's like, okay, now you're all, you're all playing parts that other actors played in a movie that I didn't think was very good either, Boy. but it's Citizen Kane compared to this. It is. I mean, the big question is, why make this movie at all, um, and I don't know if we'll ever know. But anyway, later in the show, Michelle Pfeiffer and Robert De Niro get mystical in Stardust. And next, Anne Hathaway stars in Becoming Jane. It's a small fortune, or not by me. You will have nothing unless you marry. Well, then I will have nothing, for I will not marry without affection, like my mother. And now I have to dig my own damn potatoes! Next is Becoming Jane, and on the heels of Renee Zellweger playing British author Beatrix Potter, now we get Anne Hathaway playing British author Jane Austen. Hathaway's actually pretty good, even though she's awfully voluptuous and sexy to be playing this Jane Austen. As for the movie, I thought it was actually pretty terrible. Becoming Jane would have you believe Jane Austen's own life was basically the story of Pride and Prejudice. Not only is that a huge stretch of the facts, it makes for a dull and overly familiar melodrama. James McAvoy, who's a lot more interesting to casting directors than he is to me, plays the supposedly dashing Tom LaFroy. He's bold and he's inappropriate to the secret delight of Jane. I know more of the world. <laughs> a great deal more, I gather. Enough to know that your horizons must be widened. Maggie Smith, of course, is an international treasure, but she could sleepwalk through the role of the wretchedly judgmental Lady Gresham, who doesn't think Jane is good enough for her nephew. Your father is in grave financial difficulties, but all is not lost. He has a daughter upon whom fortune has smiled. It's all perfectly well executed and perfectly consistently dull. Despite the talents of Hathaway and Maggie Smith and the ever-reliable James Cromwell, Becoming Jane was becoming a bore from the start. Thumbs down. So that was you snoring in the screening that, <laughs> that I me. watched. There, yeah, snorting maybe, not <laughs> snoring. Like, oh, there literally on. was a guy that fell asleep in the screening that I went to. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one. It's right. not my favorite movie of the year, but it's a thumbs up for me. It was kind of paint by numbers. There were moments where I thought, okay, scene in the ballroom dancing, check. You know, people who meet for the first time and don't like each other, check. check. But yeah. at the same, and also Maggie Smith, was so similar to Judy Dench in Pride and Prejudice that I r literally expected well, uh, to yeah. get one of those slips of paper that said, today the role of Judy Dench will be played by Maggie Smith. <laughs> but having said all that, yeah. it worked for me because of the two lead performances. And I'm on the side of the casting directors oh, on okay. James McAvoy. I think he's really charming. I think he's kind of like a new Ewan McGregor. Really? He's got something about him that you can't stop watching. He's really appealing, even when he's being kind of scampish. I think he's got kind of the twit factor. He just doesn't do it for me, Dave. Huh. And you know, you're, you're outlining all the reasons why you should be giving this thumbs down. It's just so predictable. And I, I think, you know, Jane Austen's life, which I know is a mystery in a lot of ways, a lot, people don't know a lot about what happened to this woman before she died at the age of 41. But just to say, well, let's just make it this, Pride and Prejudice ripoff is not very imaginative. It's a little easy, and listen, as the movie went along, I was kind of on the fence about it. But you know what? That last scene was very moving to me, and it was that that kind of put me over you the know, edge it was, to a it thumbs was, up. You know, it was moving for me. I was moving to the exit <laughs> sign. All right, coming up next, Robert De Niro in a role unlike anything he's played before in Stardust. Touché. The Balcony Archive is now available with every full-length movie review from the show online. Search by movie title, director, or actor with over 5,000 movie reviews from Roger Ebert. This is a terrific entertainment. Gene Siskel. There won't be a better film. And Richard Roper. This movie just sucks. How can uh, your heart be so cold? With special shows from the last 20 years with guest reviewers. This is the most extensive collection of video-based film reviews anywhere at themoviestv.com. I want you to say that you're going to try to make it work. Okay, looking at movies now in theaters, El Cantante got a thumbs up, Hot Rod a thumbs down, and The Ten got a thumbs up. Hey, 
You busy? Just gonna fold this piece of paper for a while, but I can do that later. Yeah, the 10 is the very definition of out there, but most of it is very, very funny, isn't it? <laughs> Amazing stuff. You will laugh. Anyway, I'm happy to report that our next movie is not a sequel. <laughs> and I'm even happier that it's Stardust, a genre-defying mashup of science fiction, romance, and comedy with a plot that's nearly impossible to describe, mm -hmm. but I will try. Long ago, in a British town called Wall, a young grocery clerk named Tristan, played by the fairly unknown Charlie Cox, wants desperately to marry his shallow but gorgeous neighbor, Sienna Miller. When they see a falling star in the sky, he offers her a strange proposition. For your hand in marriage, I'd cross the wall and I'd bring you back that fallen star. You can't cross the wall. Nobody crosses the wall. Now you're just being silly. I'm not being silly. I'd do it. Tristan then crosses into the nearby parallel universe of Stormhold, where he realizes that Star is actually a young woman named Evane, played by Claire Danes with a respectable British accent. Mm -hmm. Now, what should be a pleasant stroll back into town is made difficult by a mob of people who also want to get their hands on Evane for more nefarious purposes, notably a witch played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Capturing and killing the Star, you see, would give her eternal youth. If that wasn't enough, Tristan and Evane also encounter none other than Robert De Niro as a gay cross-dressing pirate, don't <laughs> ask, and the absolutely hysterical Ricky Gervais as a scheming traitor. His few scenes alone are worth the price of admission. <laughs> One minute. Hold on, Cuddles. 160. 160. Seeing as I'm feeling particularly generous today, I'll settle for 200. 200? OK. You're having a laugh. <laughs> Have you had your head in that? <laughs> Has he been saying that where the air's too thin? <laughs> As you can see, Stardust is plenty weird, but it's also a lot of fun, with humor that's quite reminiscent of The Princess Bride. It's based on the novel by Neil Gaiman, and you can see why he's gained such a cult following. In a summer of retreads and played out franchises, it's a truly original movie and a breath of fresh air in August, so thumbs up for me. Thumbs up for me as well, Dave, and I think you're right, you know, The Princess Bride comparison is the one that everyone's gonna make yeah. here. And though it's not quite as good as The Princess Bride, that's a classic, and to even be in that league as a sort of, you know, combination of romance and whimsy and adventure and humor. It has all those elements. I, I just found it, you know, entertaining as hell. Honestly. Yeah, and it definitely has its own unique sense of humor. Yes. Like Peter O'Toole, who I didn't mention, plays this older guy who's got all these sons who are trying to kill themselves, kill each other. And and, it's and just, they're very funny when they're dead, when yeah, they're ghosts. The they're, sons, yeah, they're yeah. kind of halfway there, half not. Yeah. And Robert De Niro, I was kind of back and forth on him. There were times where I thought, okay, he's really going over the top right. with the gayness. Yeah. But yeah. actually, it's quite necessary for the part. I won't really say why. But he, it's very different from anything we've ever seen him do before, mm -hmm. and he, he really worked for me. Yeah, I think everybody, you know, has a lot of fun here. Michelle Pfeiffer, now she's played the evil witch in two movies, because she's also the evil witch in Hairspray. It works for her. And I love her, but now I want to see her come back and, and play a different kind of character. But she's very good here. Uh, the young leads, uh, you know, they have a nice chemistry together. Even Sienna Miller kind of, you know, doing a takeoff on some of the other roles that she's played. All of it comes together in a very strange and unique way, but successfully. I just hope people see it because it's a yeah. tough sell. Yeah, I agree. Okay, next up is Rocket Science. It wowed the critics at Sundance. It's drawing comparisons to movies like Rushmore and Election. Not by me. I thought it was cloying, self-congratulatory, and irritating. Ugh. Reese Daniel Thompson plays one of the more grating characters of the year. He's Hal Hefner, an underachieving high school student with a terrible stutter. I should, um, I should really, I should, should, um, I should really probably go home now, Lewis. Okay. Perhaps blinded by his lust for debate team superstar Ginny, played by Anna Kendrick, Hale joins the team himself, even though he's incapable of ordering what he wants at lunch, let alone stringing together five words. Just because debate was a, was a wipeout, I mean, you know, a colossal wipeout, uh, doesn't mean that you're a failure. It's the activity that failed you. Something tells me rocket science might become a cult favorite. I'm not going to be a part of that cult. Oh, I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one. I fell right in. I, it's from the opening moments. Really? I thought the tone was really interesting. I thought the music was kind of cool. They use accordions and, and interesting instrumentation. See, that's... Dave, I thought that, that that's a classic example of what bothered me about this film. I thought that was so self-conscious and so, like, you know, aren't we clever? We're going to have this, you know, this crazy okay. music in there, here. There are a few moments yeah. where it was trying too hard to be clever. There's the moment where you see his friend, the, the lead character's friend's parents playing violent femmes on the piano and the cello. Okay. Oh, that was too much. Deadly. And the fact that he he carries the suitcase around instead of a backpack. That's too much, too. But those are two minor quibbles with a movie that 
is really original. I loved Anna Kendrick as mm -hmm. the debate star. I loved that all of her scenes she spoke Somehow really she fast, and I, she attention. was really, really funny. She and she was yeah, also good you in know, camp. She's good. And for the most part, yes, it has moments where you don't like how you know he throws a cello again with the cello. He See? throws a cello through someone's window, and you're you're thinking, okay, you're pushing the boundaries of likability at this point. But I disagree. I did care about him. Mm -hmm. I wanted to I wanted to see him succeed. I wanted to see him overcome the stutter. I liked the movie doesn't have the pat ending. It's not all neatly wrapped up. No, it's like it's, life. You know what? You, you mentioned a couple of these, you know, quirky self-conscious touches. I thought there were a hundred of them in this movie. Each one was, let's be original, let's be original. Hey everybody, look at us. We're being original. And that's <laughs> what I think, you know, really put me off on this movie. And I have to say it reminded me of election. Sorry. But it did. Anyway, next up is the indie comedy Two Days in Paris which is written and directed by the French actress Julie Delpy, who I love from the Before Sunrise and Before Sunset movies. Mm -hmm. This time she stars as a photographer who takes her neurotic American boyfriend, played by Adam Goldberg, to visit her parents in Paris on their way home from a disastrous vacation in Venice. Once there, they run into a bunch of her exes and they fight a lot. So, if we broke up, you would not like to see me ever again. No, I mean, if I ran into you, I wouldn't avoid you. Uh -huh. But I wouldn't go out of my way to hang out with you, no. So that means you don't think I'm a likable person outside of our relationship? Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> By the end of the movie, you don't care if they stay together or break up. You just want them to stop talking. <laughs> so it's a thumbs down for me. You know, I'm, I'm starting to get the sense that you're more like the character in Rocket <laughs> Science and I'm more like the Adam Goldberg character. Because <laughs> I like this guy. Of course he's annoying and obnoxious, but I love his delivery. Goldberg, of course, owns characters like this. He's, he's played them before. I'm giving this thumbs up, Dave. I thought it really captured what happens to couples often when they're not in their home base. She's back home, but he's on the road trip, and how things get heightened, and when a guy meets a family for the first time and meets the exes, and all that I thought was so perfectly done. And Julie Delpy, you know, she's the writer, she's the director, she's doing the music. That's her parent. Those are her parents playing her parents. It's not particularly a kind film to the French, you know? I mean, but I think she's capturing it, obviously, with, with an expert's knowledge. You didn't find it repetitious with all of the ex-boyfriends yeah, that they bit, meet? A little bit. I think it could have been tightened. I think we could have gotten a little bit more there. Her character, seems to get a little crazier as the movie goes on, but I thought it really got, gave us a lot of truths about relationships and families and how sisters interact and how women are sometimes with their ex-boyfriends. Yeah. I thought it was very smart, very funny. I'm not saying I have to like every character on screen, but he probably was the most annoying and irritating leading man I've ever seen on film. Wow! Sorry, I got wow. to say <laughs> Fair enough, my friend. Coming up next, your chance to see a small masterpiece in the Thumbs Up video segment. But first, here's a look at what's coming up on next week's show. Gangsters, what's up, guys? Mom! This week's Thumbs Up videos are brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. If I was single again, I would get right to the point. Looking at movies new on DVD, I Think I Love My Wife got a thumbs up. Vacancy and Wild Hogs both got thumbs down. My video pick this week, Dave, is The Lookout. It remains one of my favorite movies of 2007. Just beautifully done. Yeah, and the director, Scott Frank, is such a great screenwriter. He did a great job as a director, too. Absolutely. Well, my video pick is Fracture, a legal thriller starring Anthony Hopkins what? as a genius who's murdered his cheating wife and Ryan Gosling as the cocky young DA who's trying to put him away. Oh, I'm permitted the use of a private investigator. Not to investigate me. Why not you're investigating me? Because you shot your wife. Allegedly. That's how it works, right? Fracture's ending doesn't pack the punch that it should, and Hopkins' character is just begging for comparisons to The Silence of the Lambs, and guess who loses out in that comparison. But it's a thrill to see Hopkins and Gosling go head-to-head. -head. You might not be a huge fan of this movie, but I really enjoy <laughs> You're it. You're right, the Hopkins character does invite the comparison, so I'm going to make the comparison and say it's not even in the same universe. So, no, I did not recommend this film. Still worth the rental. All right, so both The Lookout and Fracture will be in stores on Tuesday. And Roger Ebert's great movie for this week, Woman in the Dunes, is also available right now. And we'll be back to recap this week's show right after this. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Man has evolved to the point where he no longer needs to stand in line for tickets. The movie tickets card available only at movietickets.com. Okay, recapping the movies on this week's show. Two thumbs down for Rush Hour 3. Two big thumbs way down for Daddy Day Camp. We split on Becoming Jane. Two thumbs up, though, for Stardust. We split again on Rocket Science. And we split one last time on Two Days in Paris. You only wanted to spend about an hour there, apparently. Maybe that should be the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there should be a sequel. Well, thank you. Even though we did disagree, thank you so much for joining me again. It Dave. was still a lot of fun. It was. Appreciate it. Sure. That's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed.
We know your dirty little secret, your mop. Get to know the cleaner way to clean with the Libman Wonder Mop. The mop head is machine washable, only from Libman. Now, Dr. Scholl's has combined two gels to create an insole so outrageously comfortable. America is totally gelling. Are you gelling yet? Dr. Scholl's. Get in. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee. How well is your child mastering the basics? Discover Kumon and let your child amaze you.